Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 75 of the podcast. And today I have quite an adventure for you. I share some tips on storing your quilts. Uh, it was a question that came in last week from Angela. So I answered that question and had a bit of a catastrophe as you will see in this video. Uh, but first I wanna introduce you to somebody new. This is Miss Millie. There's a new kitten that came up and uh, ended up in our backyard a few days ago. It was, I think it was last week. And yeah, she was a little underfed and we got her, uh, been feeding her and we noticed today she's gotten bigger. So just in case you are listening to the podcast, please know that you can also see video and this beautiful girl, uh, she has incredible coloring. It's, um, she's a calico, but then she's got these spots of ginger that are just gorgeous. Super, super active, and so far loves to claw the furniture. That is her thing. So I think Millie has chilled out, and now I can show you what I'm working on. I uh, have, this is Miss Bunny version four, and I never sealed up all of the holes that you use to stuff her. And I was glad I didn't because I ended up taking all the stuffing out of her body and picking out the stitches for her legs and flipping her legs. So her legs now point in the right direction. And now all I need to do is just sew up these holes and her body pretty much didn't change between very much. I think there were like very, very subtle changes between version four and version five. And so now I have basically two Miss Bunnies that I can enjoy and dress and uh, use to fine tune my patterns. Uh, as far as the dress, I got a lot of feedback back last week and thank you guys so much for your feedback. It's really, really helpful to know you know, what level of finishing you like, uh, you like to see on patterns. Um, this was, I think, the fifth version of the dress that I did, and I'm really pleased with it. Um, what I ultimately decided, I did try, I expanded all the seams to a half inch, and I tried French seams. French seams, especially on those sleeves, it's just too tiny. It's just too fitted in there. It was making it was making her look like she had weird shoulder pads. Uh, I mean, it was just too bulky. Um, and then I also tried a flat felled seam. Again, same problem, just too bulky. You know, if you were working with something finer, you know, like a lightweight cotton gauze, that might be one thing, or satin, that might be one thing. But this is quilter's cotton, and quilter's cotton is not the thinnest cotton in the world. And, you know, especially whenever you've got like the ruching in the skirt, it just provides too much bulk to do a fringe seam and have it end up resting flat and looking nice. Um, but yeah, I, I decided definitely a zigzag stitch or an overlock stitch is a great thing to teach. Uh, and then doing a little extra top stitching as well. So it's overlocked or zigzagged and then top stitched down. And I think that's gonna eliminate any fraying at all. And that'll be great. Uh, so I've also been playing with, this was the, the latest version of the dress that I did. Uh, I, I'll be honest, I stick with Velcro. I do a Velcro closure on these whenever I'm just testing and I'm just speed running it because it's the easiest and fastest. I can stitch it on and then know if it fits or not. Uh, but I will probably do um, snaps on this one since it turned out so nice. And this is pretty much the finished version. And then I've designed fabric for spoon flower, it's downstairs on the pressing board right now. I need to go iron it. And that fabric will be the official Miss Bunny Calico <laughs> that I describe in the book. And that was really fun. Uh, I sat down and started designing and playing and you know, kept uh, refining the color. And I used the watercolor fabrics, the watercolors that I painted several months ago and played with those in Photoshop in order to create continuous patterns. So it kind of feels like, you know, it feels like this has been months and months in of effort and, and work in like slow, steady little places. And now it's all finally coming together. And when I got that fabric and I printed out a little sample on paper, I was like, yes, that's it. That's the calico. <laughs> that's really exciting. Uh, I have been working on little bloomers and not going so hot. This is the set. This is the first set and they turned out mostly like shorts. Uh, and just so you know, you can find photos uh, of all of this that I'm describing <laughs> in, the, in the show notes. Uh, and you can find that at leahday.com slash store quilts. 
that will be where you can find the show notes to this episode. So yeah, these turned out a lot like shorts and I think those will be probably just standard Bermuda shorts, you know, or uh, if you were making a, a male Mr. Bunny doll, then they could be boxers. Uh, but that just, it wasn't, it's still not quite the look I was going for. I went super frilly and fluffy and the legs end up too tight. You know, it's kind of like, it feels like every time I make a new clothing design, then that design, I start out with an idea, a basic concept, and I keep stitching it and stitching it and stitching it. And the good thing is these take five minutes to stitch together. So it's not like I'm, you know, really <laughs> wasting a lot of time stitching out crazy ideas, uh, you know, still refining that and trying to get it just right and make it look nice. Um, my Miss Bunny doll growing up had white pantaloons. They were uh, ruched both at the ankle and around her waist and, you know, more like pants. And while I, I really like that look, that just feels a little bit too traditional. Uh, and I'm trying for something a little different. And, you know, also the idea that, you know, pants could be another pattern down the road, uh, something else to play with down the road. And, I, you know, I really like the idea of, um, you know, just a, just a cute pair of lacy panties, if I could just get the shape right. And the struggle, you know, whenever I pointed it out to Josh, he was, I was kind of asking his opinion, that the struggle is it looks weird, you know, this area around her legs where her legs are attached and stuff. And I think it will look best if, you know, the bloomers come down a little bit further than that. If, so yeah, it's a work in progress as always. And the nice thing is these don't take very long to stitch out. Uh, once I get them cut, it takes about five minutes. Even when I add the little lacy bits, uh, it was really not very time consuming. And then I slip them on and it's like, well, do I like it? Do I not like it? And every time that I don't like something, it's not time wasted. And I have to keep reminding myself of this. That's why I'm sharing it with you. It's not time wasted. I've learned something. I can move on with the design and you know do something better, do something different, make that alteration, make that pattern just a little bit stronger, try something else, stitch it again, and then ask that question all over again. What do I like? What do I not like? What needs to change? And I'm really happy that I answered the question about the seams, you know, the seam finishing. Whenever I'm just flying through a pattern really quickly, I don't finish the seams uh, because I'm just testing. But the final version, you know, and certainly the pattern instructions are going to include instructions on zigzag stitching or overlock stitching and then top stitching to really finish it and make it durable. If you want to, if you want to give this to your granddaughter, you know, or a little girl or a little boy in your life, then that's a okay. Uh, and I want you to be able to wash the doll and wash the garments as many times as you feel like it needs to, uh, and not have it all fall apart. You know, that would be really frustrating. I know a lot of my Barbie doll clothes, I was, I was thinking about that. They had holes in it, but I kept playing with it. You know, so even, even when it gets a little holy, I don't think kids really mind all that much. So new stuff this week. I'm kind of thinking, what, would, what do we have? Um, new, uh, part of the Leaf Peepers Quilt Along. So this is the Leaf Peepers Quilt that I'm doing as a quilt along with Sherry from Whole Circle Studio. And this week I shared a video on echo ditching. So echo ditching is the process of stitching a quarter inch from the seams and it creates this beautiful channel. Uh, it gets you out of the ditch so you're not having to stitch right in that seam line, which is a little tricky. It's hard to be precise. And uh, I really love it. Echo ditching is my new favorite way to secure a quilt as the first step. Uh, and it's a lot faster, it's a lot more forgiving. So come and find a tutorial on that. I shared a video on echo ditching using ruler foot quilting. So using a straight line ruler. And yes, the rulers are back in stock, yay! <laughs> you can find the slice, mini slide, and super slide rulers that I designed for Grace Company. They are all back in stock at leahday.com and uh, they work great for ruler foot quilting. And I'll be using the mini slide and slice ruler on this quilt uh, over the next couple of weeks. We're gonna be finishing this quilt up in just three or four weeks, so that's really exciting. And the nice thing is you get to piece the blocks and quilt along with this too. I really love that. Uh, I don't like stopping at just the piecing. I wanna be able to carry you through the quilting too, so that way you end up with a beautiful finished quilt that you can enjoy. And I have already been enjoying this quilt on my table. I washed it this week because James spilled 
he spilled juice or something all over it and it washed right out. So I was really, I was really pleased, <laughs> but I got all that crinkly wonderfulness going on now and it's making that quilting design stand out that much better. So that's great. Uh, so that was a tutorial that went up. You can find it at leahday.com slash echo ditch. That's where you can find that tutorial. A couple weeks ago, I also shared a tutorial on doing echo ditching on the long arm too. So uh, whether you have a whole machine or a long arm, definitely check out those tutorials. I'll link them together so that way you can easily find it. Now, Sherry is not doing uh, ruler foot quilting. Sherry really likes walking foot quilting. And so she has shared a video on how she quilted the first block, the green block, with walking foot quilting. And she shared lots of tips and tricks for getting started. So definitely go and check out her blog post at wholecirclestudio.com. Now another new thing, and speaking of walking foot and ruler foot quilting, we have a new foot set. And this is awesome. This is really exciting. Uh, this is designed and sold for the Everstone Sparrow 20, but it is compatible with any low shank machine. If you're not sure what shank your machine is, just get in touch with us uh, and I'll be able to do some research and figure it out. Um, but basically it comes with two different walking feet and the major difference is the base. So this one has a closed toe base uh, and the one that I really love, kind of fitting it back in here. <laughs> I take something out of the box and then I can't put it back in. Um, so the one that I really love has this open toe base and all of these awesome markings to help you guide you as you're quilting. And I have been searching for an excellent low shank walking foot. Since I got my Everstone Sparrow 20, I have been looking for a good walking foot and I finally found it. This is awesome. Uh, and I tested just about every single walking foot that is low shank that would fit that machine. And so many of them were just kind of flexy and wiggly and, you know, I would try and slide the quilt underneath it and if the quilt had, you know, any level of thick batting or minky on the back, it wouldn't fit when it was really clunky. Uh, but I really love that walking foot. This set also comes with a open toe darning foot and that is a nice big open toe metal base. You will need to bend that top bar back if it annoys you because this foot is designed to hop up and down, but I think the visibility you'll get on that base is gonna be great. Uh, it comes with a ruler foot, and this is slightly different from the ruler foot that I sell as a single on my site. It has a little um, split opening in the bottom so that way you can easily tuck your thread through. That's a really cool feature, and it's really well designed. I played around with this a good bit. That's an excellent foot. And this set also comes with four different snap-on feet. Uh, a patchwork foot, an open toe applique foot, a, uh, that is a patchwork foot with a guide and a, uh, a foot, this looks like an edge stitching foot. So all of those will snap right on. You don't have to undo your screw. That'll snap right on to the little snap-on attachment that comes on your machine already. So yeah, come and check this out. This is an excellent little uh, deluxe quilting foot set. Uh, if your machine is low shank or compatible with low shank machines, or you have the Everstone Sparrow 20, which I think I still absolutely love that machine. It is really, really awesome. And I have to say, I pulled in everything out of the crafty cottage because of the storm. Last week we had Florence kind of threatening uh, on the East Coast and the reports were so scary that, you know, I thought about it a lot. It's like, well, how would it feel if, you know, the Crafty Cottage takes a tumble and everything inside gets really messed up? And so I thought about it and just decided I'm not gonna take the risk. So I hauled in literally everything that was not screwed down. <laughs> so downstairs is a bit of a mess. I even brought in, I collapsed my treadle. I've gotten the Singer 27 working and I collapsed that. I, I took it apart into three pieces and we brought it inside. So I need to take that back outside again. Uh, but yeah, it's been a, kind of a mess, but uh, it's also been kind of nice because I'm able to go through everything and sort through everything and really clean up the space. And that's gonna be good too. Uh, and bringing the Everstone inside, I might shoot a few tutorials before I take it back out again. And hopefully the weather's gonna start cooling down because it has been really, really, really hot out there. I'm hoping the weather will cool down 
make it a lot nicer. And I can already tell you we're going into fall because I went out to the crafty cottage yesterday to grab something and there was a spider that big around in front of my door. I don't know why they do this and I don't know why it always has to be in front of my door. I probably would leave them alone if they were, you know, building their webs on the side of the crafty cottage, not right smack in front of my door but they inevitably always build there. And it, I almost walked into this one. It was a massive web, massive spider. Did a little bit of dancing and screaming and then picked up a stick and got rid of him. So yeah, it, I, not my favorite thing about the fall. And that was actually part of the inspiration for the bad guy in Mally the Maker book, uh, book number one is spiders just just saying little little sneak peek there and uh, just in case you're new to the podcast or you just haven't been listening along Mally the Maker is done and I got my first shipment of books and our pre-order for that fiction quilt fantasy novel is October 1st so come and check out mallythemaker.com I've set up a very very simple website um, and I'm going to start shooting tutorials for that this week and uh, yes yeah, some hand stitching stuff which is really exciting I decided to do hand stitching uh, in book one that's that's really what I spend the most time describing you know Mally has to hand stitch her way out of many different obstacles and I really want to teach hand stitching it's very different from what I've taught uh, in the past and I, I that's how I learned though as a little girl I had a sewing machine I didn't know how to use it properly uh, so I relied on hand stitching as my means to make just about everything for quite a long time until high school actually and then I finally said you know I really need to be doing this a little faster and pulled out the sewing machine and you know learned how to use it learned how to attach feet uh, and use those feet to make things easier learned how to insert a zipper all that good stuff and yeah it went from there but I really think hand stitching is a wonderful skill and I really want to learn uh I really want to learn I really want to learn how to teach it I really want to teach it too <laughs> so yeah there we go I'm um, trying to think if there's anything else oh I did have a few comments and questions that I wanted to share with you guys a um, few comments. Uh, Claire said, uh, how are you liking your frame and machine? She's talking about the Grace Cunique uh, and the Continuum frame. Are you still using Isocord thread? Have you tried Glide thread? Just wondering how they compare and thought you might know. So yes, I absolutely love my machine. I love my frame. I am still tickled to death with both and right now have that double striped diamond quilt is still on the frame and it's driving me crazy. I'm ready to be done with it. I'm ready to get it off the frame and get something new on there that I can quilt really quickly. I'm needing some speed. I'm needing some good finishes. So yeah, my goal today is to get downstairs, get on the frame and finish that quilt up and get it taken off. So that'd be great. As far as isocord thread, it is still absolutely 100% my favorite thread. Uh, I love it. It just, it's thin, it's strong, it rarely breaks. I use it for machine embroidery and it's gorgeous for machine embroidery. It's gorgeous for machine quilting. I don't use it for piecing only because it's ever so slightly slippery and tends to, it just, it just tends to unravel a little bit too much on the edges, especially if you're doing something like chain piecing uh, or uh, strip piecing where you're cutting across the seams. I just felt like it was just a little bit too slippery for that, but I'll be honest, sometimes if it's in my machine and I'm in a hurry, sometimes I'll use it for piecing too. I just lower my stitch length just a little bit lower, like 1.4 or 1.3 millimeters, go even smaller. Um, yeah, it's great stuff. I don't, I'll be honest, I don't cross and compare. Once you find what works for you, once you're happy with it, go on ahead and invest in a good collection of thread, uh, a good range of colors so that way no matter what you're quilting if you decide that you want to quilt something today you don't have to run out to the store and go get it you know get new thread stock up that kind of thing you already have a nice collection of colors available to you that you don't have to worry about that uh, and I don't cross and compare because at this stage switching threads would be a very expensive investment and I already have something that works so I don't do that very much 
Another uh, comment from Anne. Dear Leah, thinking of you, Josh and James, and your dad during Hurricane Florence, I do not know exactly where you live, but pray that you all and your property are kept safe. And thank you so much for that, Anne. Yes, we got lots of comments and well wishing. We just got rain. It, you know, it was not even all that heavy. Uh, James was out of school on Friday and then had a two hour delay on Monday, which was kind of funny because it was just a normal sunny day. Um, it was not a big deal for us, but uh, I know that's not the case for everybody. So I'm really sorry for everyone that had damage uh, or flooding or issues. Uh, we were very, very lucky. And uh, yeah, it is scary. It is scary when storms like this come through and uh, we are far, far from the coast. So, and we're not really in any risk of flooding, not at this house, at least we kind of live up on top of a hill. So I wasn't so much worried about that as the crafty cottage kind of, you know, getting uh, hit by a tree or hit by a tree limb or something like that and having an, an issue with that. So, but everything, everything worked out okay. So this is a question from Dawn. What do you think about computerized systems, long arm sewing, where you program a computerized add-on to do the pattern all over? Do you think this is something everyone should know? So what Dawn is talking about is uh, computerized automation that you can add to a long arm frame. And it's basically adding a computer system uh, to your machine so that it uh, guides the machine to move not with you. You know, you basically don't touch the machine uh, and allow it to stitch over your frame. And the way I think of it, as I think of it as turning your long arm into an embroidery machine. So uh, instead of on an embroidery machine, the hoop moving under the needle and creating that beautiful stitched artwork, the long arm machine is moving over the frame and stitching out and quilting your quilt for you. Now, as far as something that everyone should know, um, I really think that it's important to build your skills, you know, kind of on a, a level. That's why I want to do the hand stitching videos uh, and tutorials. I think it's really good to start at the bare bones basics and build your skill gradually. As you are more interested in something, then obviously investing in, in that additional equipment makes sense. Personally, I see computerized uh, systems and automation leaning more towards people that are doing professional long arming, mostly because the ability to, let's say, set a pantograph, like um, let's just say a repeating spiral, okay, uh, to be able to set that up so it stitches straight across the machine, does it automatically, that makes a lot of sense for someone that has three long arms set up in their room. They're quilting three quilts at once. They can set up one, walk over to the next machine, set it up, walk over to the next machine, set it up. By the time they get back to that first one, it's probably already stitched from edge to edge and it's ready to be advanced and, and reset. Uh, so I see that as definitely an advantage for a professional long armor, someone that's doing this for a living uh, and needing that level of speed, certainly. Uh, and as it's something I wanna play with, I really do. I'm really intrigued by it, uh, but it is expensive. Usually the system can add another five to $10,000 to the long arm and the machine. The thing I really want you to understand is that you can always add that later. You don't have to have all the bells and whistles attached to your machine the second that you buy it. And I think it's better to start with the basics and then go from there. So start with just a machine and a frame and just play with moving the machine around, you know, just get a hold of it and learn how that works. Start at the beginning. And, you know, it's a speed thing more than anything else. The automation allows you to get perfect stitches. It allows you to get a perfect stitch pattern. And, and that's a great advantage, but you have to look at, is it, is it worth that much extra cash? You know, that's the ultimate thing. I do think it's really fascinating. And I have a set of pantographs that I am working on. Uh, I've been working on those in Illustrator. Dad did uh, some kind of initial drawing for me. And then now I need to take them and clean them up and make sure that they, you know, start and end at the same points. And then that's something I want to get on the frame and play with, with a new quilt. You know, doing some quilting from the back of the frame, uh, following a pantograph with the laser light and see how that works. 
And we have one last question from Rachel. How do you make a design wall? And this is great. I think everyone needs to have a design wall somewhere in your house. It is so, so useful. Uh, but basically go to the hardware store and look for poly, uh, polystyrene boards. They can also be called insulation sheeting. It's that blue, sometimes pink, but most of the time it's that baby blue, um, stiff insulation boards. They're usually sold in a four foot by eight foot section. So you'll need a truck and bungee cords because the stuff is very lightweight and it can just fly off the back of the truck. So uh, go in ahead and get yourself enough boards that you can completely cover a wall. And usually I just lean it right up against the wall and it will hold. Um, keep in mind I have low ceilings in my basement. So it kind of, I just kind of squish the boards up against my low ceilings. And if you have higher ceilings, then you could just drill through it with a single screw and that would probably be enough to hold it in place. Uh, I like to keep my boards loose so that way I can pull them off the wall anytime I need to do blocking and I will block my quilt on the boards too so they have dual purpose. If you wanna get really fancy, then you can put the polystyrene on the wall and then cover it with a layer of flannel. The flannel will kind of grip your fabric and so you won't have to pen every single piece that you put on the design wall, which is really nice. Um, but you know, a lot of times because I'm, I'm constantly taking my boards down and putting them back up and stuff, I don't usually mess with it. I just leave my boards bare and blue and they don't look all that great, but it's better than nothing. So it's really nice to be able to pen into it. Uh, it's not necessarily self healing, but you can kind of, it can take a lot of abuse. You can pen and pen and pen into polystyrene and it won't tear up. Outside, I actually hung two or three boards uh, on the back of my house for photo, uh, shooting, shooting photographs of my bigger quilts. Uh, I reached a point where, you know, in my house, it's just, there's not a lot of blank walls that I can shoot a photograph, you know, edge to edge and top to bottom of a quilt. And then lighting is also a challenge too. Getting a quilt evenly lit, you know, requires lots and lots of standing lights. And even, you know, even with every single thing pulled out and practically my entire living room rearranged, I found I still could not get a good shot in my house. So I started shooting outside, natural light, you know, a nice overcast day is perfect. And I just screwed poly, you know, polystyrene boards to the back of my house. It doesn't look all that great, but it's the back of my house. So it doesn't really matter. And I go out there and put a sheet over it. Uh, I just pin a bed sheet over it and then I pin the quilt in place and try not to drop it on the ground because it's muddy and dirty and I need a, I really need to level out the ground underneath my outdoor design wall and put in some sort of patio or something to keep it really, you know, kind of flat. But for right now, it's, it's not the best, but it works. And that's the point. Sometimes you just got to make do with what you got and that really works out well. And it's as simple as, you know, one or two polystyrene boards and a little bit of flannel if you want to be fancy and you have a design wall. It's excellent. And I can say of all the things that I've invested in, I can really pinpoint maybe three things that have made a radical, almost instantaneous overnight improvement in my quilting skill. A design wall is number one. A flatbed sewing table is number two. It makes a radical difference. Until you have one, I can't explain how it works, but it really is huge. I'm trying to think, what is number three? Number three would probably be modifying my darning foot. Once I started doing that, that made a huge difference. So those three things, a design wall, flatbed table, modifying the darning foot. And yep, that's it. I think that that is enough and that and a lot, a lot, a lot of practice. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty much it for the updates around the house. And I managed to seal up both of these seams on the backs of Miss Bunny's legs. So she is one step closer to being nice and sealed up. I just got her little armholes and her back. And yeah, then I'll make her another dress and keep stitching out these bloomers until I get them just right. Yeah, it's super cute. And this has been such an adventure. I love these dolls. They have been so much fun to create. And I just hope that when you read Mally the Maker that you fall in love with Miss Bunny. She's a character in the book. I hope you fall in love with her just as much as I am because she is 
one of my favorite characters. And once I get this doll done, then of course I'm gonna go make Mally too, but Miss Bunny had to be first. So that's it for the updates around the house. And now here is the podcast all about storing your quilts. And yes, it's a bit of an adventure. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 75 of the podcast. And today I have another reader suggestion. This came in from Angela. She said, great label insights. This is about last week's post when I shared tips on naming your quilts and labeling. She said, you mentioned near the end uh, to add a label with care instructions for the quilt and mentioned how to place, how placing a quilt in a cedar chest wasn't the best idea. That would be a great tutorial, the proper care for quilts. I had not known about that before, so now I'm wondering what else I don't know. So that is a great podcast episode. Uh, I think I can talk quite a lot about uh, quilt care and how I store my quilts. And it all starts with something that looks like this. This is a very long tube. And I actually base this off of pool noodles. So inside the fabric is uh, a pool noodle that I then wrap in thick cardstock and pin into the pool noodle to keep the cardstock all the way wrapped around it. And the reason for that is pool noodles actually will leach color. Whatever color they are will start to leach out and into your quilt. So it's really important to cover them completely. And then as you can see, I also cover it with a layer of fabric too, uh, and just sew up those ends so it's nice and tight. So what is the point of this pool noodle contraption? This is how I store my quilts. I roll them onto this and then store them in the closet. Uh, so this is 365 free motion quilting designs and I am ready to put it away. And it just so happens to coincide with day 500 of the free motion quilting project. We finally reached our 500th design. Uh, so it's nice to have it out. I love pulling it out and just being inspired by all the beautiful designs, but it's getting into fall and I really wanna put another quilt on the wall right here. So here's what I do. Oh! <laughs> Not that. <laughs> Not that at all. <laughs> okay. Um, well, those old brackets were very, very old and they finally collapsed. So basically I'm going to need to be doing a little bit of a rebuild now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is really unexpected. Okay, so let me explain how this was hung to start with. This is actually a very, very old setup and I will probably fix this and repair it very differently than what it was right now. Um, basically, this was a big giant curtain rod and you can see the hook on the ends uh, and the brackets that hold it to the wall had been wearing out quite a bit uh, for a while. And I think pulling on it just then, that was, you know, yeah, that was, that was the last straw. So it's okay, you can always do this rolling. You don't have to do it on the wall. You can also do it on the floor. So here we go, I'm gonna spread it out and thankfully my floors are somewhat clean. Yeah, see, the plastic just shored right off, but I got 10 years of use out of that thing, so I'm pretty pleased. Okay, at least nobody got hurt, right? <laughs> All right, here we go. So now I'm gonna place the pool noodle, slide my chairs out of the way here. I'm expecting to be able to do the standing and now I'm gonna be down here instead. So Josh is very nicely being my cameraman now because this is just not working the way I was expecting it to, but that's okay. You know, sometimes this is just what happens. Um, so yeah, I placed the pool noodle right in the middle of the quilt, start in the middle and begin rolling it up. And you wanna get it nice and even so that it's gonna roll up nice and straight and square. This is kind of like rolling a quilt onto the rails of a long arm frame. Uh, it is nice to have a second set of hands. You can keep it nice and tight. You can see it's kind of buckling out on this side and not wanting to play nicely with me. Just fiddle with it here. Kind of twist it and squish it into submission. There we go, okay. And then as I go, I can spread it out. Sometimes I've had to roll my quilts, like if I did a, a guild presentation or something, I would roll my quilts on the floor and then bring them home and lint roll them and then uh, clean them up real good and then re-roll everything. Sometimes I'd bring my quilts rolled, then unroll them and then take them home folded. You know, you just have to kind of work with what you got, you know, and this looks good. So you can see it's nice and tight, rolled up just like so. Now there's a second half to this and that is the sleeve. 
So whenever I am sewing this together, I roll the quilt nice and tight onto the pool noodle, that sleeve, measure, and that circumference is what I make the sleeve. Uh, and I make it a little bit long. Uh, I do sew up one end so that way it's an actual kind of think pillowcase and it's not open on both ends. That way I can use gravity to really help me uh, slide it in and get it on there nice and tight. So here we go. I'm going to pop this on and I just wiggle that tube over the quilt and I just work a little bit at a time, wiggle back and forth, and you really just need to get into the center. Keep that nice and stretched out long. The fabric sometimes wants to twist on you. You just have to watch out for that. Get it to about the middle, and then you can pick it up and really use gravity to your advantage. Untwist this. And it, yes, it always does end up on the floor eventually. Once I get the curtain rod taken out, then I usually end up putting the actual case on, usually bent over. Okay, so now grab a hold of it and just shake. And that goes a little faster. And you might be wondering about space. And as you can see, this is a pretty big quilt. Fold it up, it takes up a good amount of space in my closet. Rolled up, it still takes up a good amount of space in my closet. Uh, I don't think that the tubes take up more space than they would if they were folded. And the nice thing about the tube is it is far less wearing on the quilt itself. I feel like I've gotten stuck. So I come down here and tug on it and start lifting again from the bottom. There we go. So I feel like this is far less wearing in the quilt itself because folds in a quilt put creases in the quilt. Over time, if you leave the same folds in the quilt uh, for a long period of time, then those folds can become discolored. Uh, they can start wearing out, even if you're not even using the quilt and it's just stored, you know, uh, like I said in the last video, stored in a cedar chest, not the best because then those folds are coming in contact with the cedar wood, which can also cause discoloration. Now, if you wanna use a cedar chest, if you have something really nice that's been passed down, don't throw it away. Uh, just line it, you know, like how I line my pool noodle with uh, acid-free paper. Do something like that, line it with a layer of batting, uh, some paper, some fabric. Put several layers of material, preferably archival uh, acid-free paper, something like that, uh, that will have a nice barrier between the wood and the fabric of the quilt. I think that's a good idea. Um, I'm trying to think what else. So yes, it does take up some space. I don't do this with all of the quilts. Like let's say the quilts that I'm gonna use on my bed, it gets folded. You know, it's, it's a quilt that I wash. It's really, this is something I do for show quilts. Also for quilts that are really, really special to me that were passed down from my great grandmothers. Some of them I'll roll together. So I'll take two or three of them and roll them together and put them in one tube. And that saves a little bit of space, but it just ends up being a bigger and bigger tube. And yes, this can get a little heavy. Uh, and that's another thing to watch out for. Uh, you want to make sure to put it into your closet where it's not going to suddenly fall and hit you. <laughs> that has happened before, yes. And I have now several dozen of these and I'll take you into the other room and show you how that goes. And as you can see, this has gotten just a little bit stuck here. This is like on the level of the videos that I have done, epic catastrophe, <laughs> it really is. And now I'm hitting the ceiling a little bit. I think that is, well, it's starting to move. Honestly, it seems like I can do this by myself, you know, speedy, like I'm, I need to get it done before James gets home from school and I'll be able to slide a quilt in and get it all finished up A-OK, -okay. turn a video camera on and try and film it and ooh, it doesn't work out so well. So yeah, I'm just going to nudge and tug and keep working this up and then we're gonna move into the closet and I will show you how I have all of my quilts stored in the closet and how all that works. 
So I finally got the sleeve on this quilt. I think the main reason it was fitting uh, kind of weird and not going on very well is because I didn't get the quilt super, super tight to the pool noodle. Again, it's really nice to have a second set of hands when you're rolling the quilt onto the noodle. It's not absolutely required. I do think it's easier on a carpeted floor though because the quilt won't slide around so much. So another tip. So here is my closet where I store all of my quilts and just slide it into this top shelf and move that chain. And as I said, you know, the bigger and heavier the quilt, the bigger and heavier the tube. And yes, if it fell off, all of these fell out of the closet at once, it would be bad. Uh, I do have plans to kind of build up a side here and a second shelf, uh, because obviously I'm kind of reaching capacity on this shelf. Another thing that I realized after the fact is that these really do need to be labeled, uh, preferably on this hangy end, so that way I know which quilt is which. As you can see, a lot of these I ended up just doing in white, and they all look the same. I mean, I, there are several quilts in here. I'm like, which quilt is that? And then I have to pull it out and look at the binding, and then I end up knowing which is which. Uh, but this works great for special quilts, for quilts that you don't pull out very much or maybe once or twice a year to hang on your wall. Uh, this is a great system. I think this is also a good system for heirloom quilts uh, where you really want that to last. You really you know, don't wanna be pulling it out a whole lot. It's very, very special to you, it has sentimental value. Rolling it onto the tube means there will be no crease lines and you wanna roll it so a quilt hangs vertically, you wanna roll it with that length, okay? You don't wanna roll it side to side or the edges of the quilts will always roll uh, weird. You always wanna roll it um, with the tube horizontal to the way the quilt is hanging. And we'll go into the other room. I've got one more quilt to put up and I'll show you the other way. I'm gonna build a new system on my other wall and I'll show you how I hang with that using magnets. So here is Shadow Self, and this quilt is hung a lot closer and tighter to the wall because as you can see, it's just hung on high powered magnets. So these are rare earth magnets that I found on Amazon and I'll make sure to link to them so you can find them too. And then inside the hanging sleeve here, I have galvanized metal bars. That's what this is. So this is another thing I found at Lowe's. Uh, you find these in the construction kind of trusses section. And then I strap them together with amazing tape. Amazing tape is really special. It's not sticky. You're not gonna get any kind of sticky residue or anything. It only sticks to itself. It's kind of like uh, upholstery vinyl is what it feels like to me, but there's something else in there that causes it to stick to itself really well. So I overlap those bars and then wrap it, wrap it, wrap it with the amazing tape and that creates, as you can see, a rigid yet flexible bar and you could take this and you could go around corners so if you had a quilt and you wanted it it was really wide and you wanted to go around a corner you could put more bars together and actually bend it and go around a corner with this system you'll need extra magnets along the sides because obviously you won't be connecting in the corner but you'll need extra magnets along the sides in order to counterbalance the pull of the quilt but really cool stuff. So I hope that you've enjoyed this. It's been a little bit weird, <laughs> but I've thoroughly enjoyed showing you how I hang my quilts, how I will be repairing the hanging area over there, and also how I store them. This is something that's really important, and I hope that you will put a little bit more thought into how you store your quilts. Um, folded up is perfectly fine if that's the best that you can do. Just make sure to take the quilt and refold it about every three months. And what that means is if the quilt has been folded this way, you take it and you fold it in the opposite way so that they don't have the same creases creasing all the time. Another thing that can help is to do tri-folds. So instead of folding it straight in half, which creates really sharp fold, fold it in thirds like this, and that can help too. So lots of different ideas. Uh, definitely learn more and uh, keep trying new ways of hanging and enjoying and storing your quilts. So that's it for this podcast episode. I hope you've learned a lot and had an adventure with me today. Find more podcast episodes at leahday.com slash podcast. And don't forget to check out our day 500 sale at leahday.com. Until next time, let's go quilt.